the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Do you feel like that today? Oh, come on. You're not convincing me. I said, do you feel like that today? Are you glad to be here today? Are you ready to give God some praise today? Is God worthy today? God, we lift you up together. God, we praise your name this morning. God, you are worthy.
so glad to be here, Jesus. You made me glad, Lord. You're so awesome, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So good to see everyone here today. I'm so glad to be in church. I don't know about y'all. Amen. Amen. This morning in Morning Manna, we were talking about the helmet of salvation. And, and sometimes we have this battle that's in our minds. And I want to encourage you today that you come in this church and you put aside every distraction. And we have this battle in our mind, but guess what? We have salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for some peace. Pray for encouragement. Amen. Anybody have any prayer requests today? Amen. As we go through the rest of this service, and I see all the hands that are raised. I believe a God that can touch. I believe a God that can heal, and I believe a God that can deliver. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You have made us glad. We're so thankful for everything you've done, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we come in here today, we ask that you just take away every distraction, Lord. Lord, we focus on you and focus on what you have for us, Lord Jesus, what you have for the rest of this service. Every person that's walked through those doors, God, that we leave different, Lord Jesus. We leave blessed. We leave touched, Lord Jesus. We believe in you, and we believe in your message today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. As we continue to worship, if you have any needs you would like the minister to pray for, these altars are open.
Come on, church. Isn't there somebody who can give some praise to God? Because Jesus changes everything. No matter the situation, no matter what you're going through, Jesus changes everything. We want to welcome you to the sanctuary this morning. We're so glad you're here, whether you're online or in person. We're so glad to have you here. Any first-time guests, second-time guests, if you've been here a hundred times, we're still so thankful you're here. Why don't we give all our guests a hand clap right now? As, uh, as the ushers make their way up here, we'll make a couple quick announcements. Next Sunday after church, if you are attending NAYC, we need to meet with you after service. Plan on about a 15 minute, 15 minute meeting um, to go over where we stand um, on fundraisers and what we've got coming on. If you want to work the yard sale, please see my wife before you leave today. If you 
don't know who my wife is, she's waving at you right now. <laughs> so she can get you signed up and make sure we have account for who's coming. If you would right now, lift your hands up and let's pray, pray over this offering. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for each and every person that's here. God, we thank you for the gifts that are about to be given. God, we pray you your blessings over the gift and the giver. And we thank you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. March your offerings up here. Praise with them. today. God, I'm thankful your name's been applied to my life. Amen. If you've been down in the water, that name was spoken over you. No other name I know. Well, Brother Chris, what's that mean? It means that when I'm sick, I can say that name. If I don't know nothing else, I know Jesus. And I know Jesus has it under control. Amen. Come on, church. Let's bless him together.
come on, if he's been good, you ought to bless the Lord. If he woke you up this morning, you ought to bless the Lord. God, we ought to bless you today. God, you're worthy today. Come on, somebody, lift your voice. Come on, come on, somebody, get out of your seat. Come on, let's worship him. what you've done, but God, I'm going to worship you for what you've come to. I'm going to worship you for loved ones. I'm going to worship you for healing. I'm going to worship you for blessing. God, you're so good to me. I don't deserve it, but God, you are good. Come on, did anybody come to bless the Lord today? I don't know what you came to do, but I came to bless the Lord today. I'm not sure what you think our reason for being here is today, but I came to bless the Lord. How about you? Come on, did anybody else come to bless the Lord today? Did anybody else come to lift him up? Did anybody else come to magnify his name? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, I've come to magnify the Lord today. How about you? Come on. I said, I've come to magnify the Lord today. How about you? Amen. You know, it really comes down to this today. You want me to tell you what it comes down to? This is how easy the choice is and really what your options are, okay? You can either magnify the Lord or you can magnify your problem. That's what it comes down to. You can magnify Jesus or you can magnify your trouble. I don't know about you, but my trouble is with me always anyway. I don't really want to focus on my problem today for the next little bit. I don't want to focus on any difficulty going on in my life, any sickness, any issues, any problems. I want to magnify and focus on the one who is the answer to it all. Hallelujah. 
So what will you do today? What will you do before we leave this house? Are you going to spend the next hour magnifying your troubles and your problems? Or will you join with me and let's say, hey, let's check all that at the door for now. And let's magnify the one who is the answer. Let's magnify the one who can touch every situation and make it brand new again. Come on, I want you to just take about 30 seconds and forget about everything else right now. But let's magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in this house. Would you do that with me? Would you do that with me? Would you just magnify the Lord with me today? Would somebody lift up the name of Jesus today? Would somebody lift him up, lift him up, lift him up? Come on, somebody ought to go ahead and step out into the river right now because the water is stirring. Come on, somebody ought to step out into what God is doing right now. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Oh, somebody. Somebody, you ought to grab hold of every word that's already been spoken out loud. Amen. Every song that's been sung, the words that have been spoken, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but the words spoken through the songs that have been sung are meant to stir something within your spirit. We open this service by saying, He hath made me glad now I, I just want to take a moment I, I want to take a moment and help you maybe just put that in its proper perspective the, the song doesn't say my family situation has made me glad my, the song doesn't say my work situation has made me glad it doesn't say the state of my health has made me glad. It doesn't say my bank account has made me glad. My God, y'all ain't hearing me today, are you? It, it doesn't say my best friend has made me glad. My husband has made me glad. My wife has made me glad. My, my children have made me glad. No, it says he has made me. Oh, if you're in this building today and you've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have what it takes inside you for gladness to dwell up within your spirit. You see, the Bible says that in His presence there is fullness of joy so whether you're happy or sad 
whether you're depressed or glad today. I'm not discounting anything anybody's going through. But I'm telling you, I'm asking you, and I'm encouraging you to tap into the Spirit of the God that lives inside of you right now and make a conscious decision and choice right now. I will rejoice because He has made me glad. hath made me glad. He has made me glad. Are you thankful for the Holy Ghost today? Come on, is anybody thankful for the presence of the Lord you feel in this house? Praise God. We are so excited for everything the Lord has been doing in our church. Amen. Thankful for the moving of the Spirit that we have had over the last few weeks. God has been blessing the sanctuary, and we are so grateful and thankful beyond anything for that. Amen. How many is thankful for the touch of the Lord upon your church today? Amen. We've seen, we've seen people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We've seen people being baptized in Jesus' name over the last few weeks. And for that, we are so very grateful and excited. We've been holding on to this certificate for a couple of weeks because he doesn't, doesn't get to come in that often. But, Brother A.J., we got a baptismal certificate for you today. Baptized in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give Brother A.J. a big hand. We rejoice in what God's done for him. Praise the Lord. We have some others, too, that we have certificates uh, for, and we look forward to giving those to them. Amen. God is doing some great things in people's lives. I love it when I hear reports. Uh, Pastor God has really been, again, dealing with me, been stirring me, been doing something in me. Well, that's exactly what the, we want to see happen. Amen. Man, that's exactly what, that's why we preach, that's why we sing, that's why we worship, that's why we do everything that we do here at the sanctuary, because we believe that when you leave this place, you take Jesus with you. Amen. You don't leave Jesus here, you don't leave the Spirit of the Lord here, you take Jesus with I believe God should go with you to your job. I believe the Lord should go with you to your school. Come on, somebody. I said, I believe God should go with you to the doctor, to the gym, to whatever it is that you do all throughout the week. Amen. You take the Holy Ghost with you, and he continues to work on you. How many of you have ever felt the Lord stir something within you two, three, four days after a church service where God's still kind of working on you based on what you heard and what you felt? That's what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen? Amen. And while you're turning in your Bibles, Judges chapter number 6. Praise God. Judges chapter number 6. Making this announcement. We had it on the screens Wednesday night. We'll announce it today, Wednesday, and next Sunday. And uh, just letting you know, this didn't make it onto the announcement loop, but our annual church business meeting uh, for all of our members that want to be a part of that will be next Sunday. We always have it the last Sunday of March. Uh, so that is next Sunday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. If you want to be here, it's certainly not mandatory, but you are welcome uh, if you're a part of this church family to be here for that. Everybody say amen. Judges chapter 6 is where I'm going to read, and then I'm going to cross-reference into Galatians chapter number 6 as well. Be in prayer for Brother and Sister Wagers. They're not here today. They have preached uh, a few times over the last few weeks in Oneida, Tennessee for Brother and Sister Gibson. Brother Gibson had surgery uh, a couple of weeks back and, and had some, uh, some, some slight complications with that. It's not been feeling well, and uh, they've been going over there and helping out, and we miss Brother and Sister Wagers when they're not here, don't we? Uh, so be in prayer that God will bless their services today as well, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost will be upon that church. Amen. Judges chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown, pay attention to this passage here. So it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. Everyone say the harvest. They encamped against them and destroyed the harvest. Till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. And they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. Say that last phrase with me, because of the Midianites. We find that phrase mentioned in verse number 2, because of the Midianites. We also find it mentioned in verse number 6, because of the Midianites. Something's going on here with Israel. Something's happening that is not supposed to happen, but it's happening anyway. Scripture talks about the Midianites coming against them, and the Bible said that they destroyed the increase of the earth. I told you they destroyed the harvest that the Israelites had planted. So I've come to preach today for just a few moments on this very simple thought, the harvest is worth fighting for. The harvest is worth fighting for. Can I make it personal today? I'll turn it around, not changing the title completely, but I want to say it this way. Your harvest is worth fighting for. Come on, say it Say it with me. Say, my harvest is worth fighting for. Come on, would you say it like you really mean it? My harvest. I'm not going to sit back and let the enemy pummel my fields anymore. My harvest is worth fighting for. My family is worth fighting for. Come on, would you love him one more time? Give him some praise in this house. God bless us through the word. Jesus' name. Before you're seated, how many are glad to see Milan home today? Good to see my boy home. Love him so much. Greet somebody in Jesus' name. You may be seated. The house of the Lord. I'm trying to move quickly because that worship and that exhorting just a few minutes ago took a little bit of breath that I know I'm going to need right now. The sixth chapter of the book of of Judges is probably a familiar passage of Scripture for most of you here today, for many of you here today. If you have participated in any of our programs here, if you have read the Scripture yourself, if you spent time in the Word of the Lord, if you spent time in Sunday school, there are is one particular story in this chapter of the book of Judges that I know you're familiar with. We've all read it, we've heard, we've possibly even repeated the story of the incredible victory that God brought about at the hands of a man named Gideon. How many of you have heard and rejoiced at the story of Gideon before? Say amen if you have. The story of Gideon is a, is a remarkable story. The men that, that fought with Gideon, how the Lord brought that about, it's an incredible story, the whittling down 
of the amount of men, all of that. It's an incredible uh, story of faith. It is a faith-building uh, account from the Word of the Lord, and we love it. We, we like to talk about it. But, but before we get there, before we get to that in the Scripture, before we uh, study anything about Gideon threshing wheat in the wine press, and, and, and before we, we read anything about uh, the mighty man of valor that he is, this, this tale of tremendous victory and triumph, we, we find something else happening that preceded that entire story. There was something that happened that got Israel to the place they were that required or made the way for Gideon to step forward and bring that victory to pass. We, we find Israel dealing with a struggle. How many of you know what struggle feels like? We find Israel dealing with a, a, a national, a, a, a people-wide struggle. And this struggle is, is one uh, somewhat of their own making. The Bible tells us that they had they had done wrong in the sight of the Lord, and because of what they had done, God had had delivered them into the hands of their enemy. And what begins to happen next, we see it's one thing for you to kind of be paying the price for this, but it's another thing uh, for you to just kind of be uh, making it worse. And Israel was, I, I believe, making it even worse. They, they were no longer inhabiting the farms uh, that they had been given. They, they, had no, they were no longer living in and inhabiting the fields uh, where their forefathers established their homes and established their, their habitation. But instead, we find them, at least seasonally, we find them hiding. They have, they have fled into the mountains, and now they are, they're hiding in caves, caverns. They're, they're peering out from behind rocks. And, and, and they're, they're looking down on an area that they're not currently inhabiting. Israel had fled to the mountains. And the Bible said that they had, they had carved out dens there. They had they'd carved out caves there. They had, they had built their own strongholds there. Why? Why? Why had they done that? Well, they had run to these mountains to escape the, Midi the Midianites. They were escaping their enemy. And now the chosen people of God are left in the mountain, peeking out from behind the outcroppings of rocks and the caverns, and they're watching helplessly as the hordes of, of, Mennonite, of the Midianites and, and the Amalekites all are sweeping through the, their well-watered fields, and they're doing this every year at the time of harvest. Every year at the time of harvest, the enemy is sweeping in and he is plundering the bounty that rightfully belongs to God's people. But this is not a new thing. This has been happening now for a while. By the time we read about it here, it's been going on for a little bit. For seven years, as a matter of fact, for seven years, the people of God, for seven years, the children of Abraham have found themselves peeking out from this all too familiar vantage point, watching the destruction, watching the desecration of the harvest, which they themselves have been working to sow and to water and to cultivate, and they're watching it be devoured and wiped away and destroyed by Midian. Seven long years. Now, they have found in this time that you can set your watch by it, that you can depend on it happening because it happens every year. It never fails to occur. You plant and you water, but every year at harvest time, the harvest is stolen away. You work to plow and you sow the fields and yet the reward of your labor is ripped right out from under you. Seven long years this has been going on. Each harvest season brings with it the multitude of Midianites. Their cattle 
and their tents, the Bible says, are as a swarm of grasshoppers. The Word of God describes their people and camels as being without number. There are many of them. And for seven hopeless years, God's people are confined to caves in the mountains as their hard work that they have just been cultivating is consumed by the enemy. All of their harvest, everything they've been working for, everything they've been trying so hard to bring to pass is being destroyed every year by the enemy. And it all seems so unfair, doesn't it? When you read about it, it's hard not to get a little bit angry because it all seems so very unfair. And I'm sure every planting season, someone in the crowd, someone among the people of God are hoping, they've, they've got some measure of hope that maybe this year just might be different. Maybe this year Midian might, might forget about us over here. You know, maybe this year they'll move on to some other pushover and they'll leave us alone. Maybe, just maybe they'll, they'll let us be and we can finally enjoy our harvest. But way back in the book of beginnings, way back in the book of Genesis, we find God, we begin to see God's patterns of truth being illustrated through the creation process. He establishes certain unquestionable truths that literally, ladies and gentlemen, hold the entire universe together. The first thing he establishes is the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. That's something that you're going to have a very difficult time overcoming. You can try, but you would not be successful. You can try to do it, but it's going to take over. Engineering has enabled us to suspend that law through jet travel and different elements such as this. But what happens when that technology begins to fail is that gravity is still there. So what goes up must come down. Same is true in the spirit world. We understand, obviously, that that same law applies in a sense, that that which goes up from the earth then comes back down. He established these laws that are not ever done away with. The law of gravity. The law of attraction. What is the law of attraction? Well, that like attracts like. Like attract. You take two magnets, you turn one on the wrong end, and it, they will repel each other because contrary to what our world tries to teach, opposites do not attract. Opposites repel. The law of attraction states, now I know there's... there's, there's <laughs> I know there's probably a case study that says opposite. You may look and say, well, me and my spouse are totally different. But I'll promise you, way back at some point or another, there was something that attracted you to each other, and it was something that the two of you all had in common. We are attracted to things that are like us. We make friends with people who like things that we like. We have common denominators. We have common interests. We, we surround ourselves with, with people who, who tend to think a little bit more. Like It's a challenge for us, really, to surround ourselves with people who think differently than we do. So there is this law of attraction that is quite literally immutable. But there's another law. In addition to gravity, in addition to attraction that God established in the world, and that is the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest. The law of the harvest basically states, and I'll get to the scripture in a minute, but it says that whatever you put into the ground is exactly what will grow out of the ground. Whatever you plant is what you will reap. 
you can't, exp- you can't expect to plant corn and reap potatoes. I'm not even an expert gardener, and I know that. You can't expect to plant one thing and harvest something else. And quite literally, the analogy there is so true and pure that you you can't expect to plant sin and reap righteousness. You can't expect to plant bad things and habits and negativity and reap blessing. It doesn't work that way. If you plant those bad things and yet Your harvest includes good things. One thing has happened. You have stolen someone else's harvest. It's quiet right now. That's all right. Because that's not what you planted. And the law of the harvest is immutable. The law of the heart, God doesn't even suspend it. I have found that to be true. Now that is within his power to do so. But I cannot tell you that the number of times that I have spoken with people, I have dealt with folks, and, and, and you have perhaps too, and I, I've even had people that have come to church and they've, they've come to, to the Lord and they've repented of their sins and they've begun to live for God. But yet something they did out in the world and something they did before they ever came to God, maybe it was a bad decision they made, maybe it was even a legal uh, something, uh, consequence, but but God does not wipe that away just because you choose a different path. Because whatever's planted in the ground is going to eventually come out of the ground. And when it comes out of the ground, the season of reaping may be when you've turned another corner and you're living a different life but you're going to have to endure that season of reaping and hope and pray and expect that all of the good planting you are now doing is going to come up in due se- because it will it will and most of the time when we talk about the law of the harvest most of the time when we even refer to this we, we understand that, that, that even in the New Testament, Paul is keenly aware of this in Galatians chapter 6. He says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's established in the word of the Lord. God founded it. It is, it is established. There's nothing any of us can do about it. And we've all heard the verse, haven't we? We've all heard that scripture. We have all, uh, we've quoted it to other people. I know I have quoted it more times than I can tell you. We've all heard it, and, but we've all usually heard it to point out the negative. That's most of the time what we say. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You're going to reap what you sow. It, how many know any time you ever, most of the time you ever say the words, reap what you sow to people, it's over something bad. Most of the time, if you ever say it to your kids, it's because they, 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 are, they are messing with you. They are making you pull your hair out. Honey, one of these days, you're going to reap what you sow. And you say stuff like, one of these days, you're going to have a kid who treats you like you treat me. Because every time we say, you're going to reap what you sow, it always has to do with you can't plant Bad things in the ground and expect to get good things. You can't plant negativity and expect to get positive. You can't plant sin and expect to get righteousness because whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And yes, the way we quote it, the way we say it is absolutely true. After all, the next verse does go on to say, For he that soweth to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But bad is not the only thing you can sow, is it? And if you take the passage as a whole, we can see an even more powerful concept begin to be revealed. Because the very next verse says this, verse 9, And let us not be weary in well Doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So Paul has spun it around 
And he's saying to us basically here in the 21st century, don't, 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 don't just be quoting this verse to talk about planting bad stuff. You also need to be quoting this verse to talk about the good that's being done. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It's conditional, right? He says we shall reap. Understand, the condition is placed on you. The condition is not placed on the harvest. Remember what I told you a moment ago. The harvest is immutable. That's the law. God established that. Whatever's put in the ground is going to come up. What Paul says is in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. I want you to already be there with me. Doing well is rewarded with a promised harvest. If you sow, there will always be a reaping. The law is above violation. The law is an immutable truth. Whatever you plant in the ground will always bring forth its own fruit. Sounds great, right? Sounds wonderful. What's the problem? Problem is, some people never get to see their own harvest. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> You're right. It's not fair to you. Some people... Never see their own harvest. What do you mean? That's not fair. I don't understand why that would be. You're right. It's not fair. But let me ask you, who are you going to blame? Don't blame your brother because your brother's busy harvesting his own field. Don't blame God because God has ordained the laws and put them into place. And they work the same for everyone. Well, surely it's the devil, right? Surely it's, it's, it's Satan. That, that, that's who it is. He's the one to blame for everyone, everything. Surely it's him. Well, well before, you, before you write that off, remember the devil's the devil. The devil's always going to do devil things. The devil's always going to do what the devil does. The devil has one M.O. That's, he has come for one reason. That is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That is, he doesn't even try to hide. Or he does try to hide it. But that, that, that is who he is. That's what he does. That's him, his M.O. That's what he's come to do in your life. That's, that's his goal. His goal is to destroy anything good in your life. Pastor? And I've been sowing, and I've been sowing, and I've been working, and I've been working, and I haven't reaped anything. So had Israel. So had Israel. Let's read it again, can we? We just did. Let's read it again. And so it was. Verse 3, when Israel had sown, they did it, right? They put it in the ground. That the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor Asked. Notice these words, when Israel had sown. Is anybody still with me today? When Israel had sown. Nobody's sitting at home. Nobody's refusing to work. 
Israel isn't expecting something for nothing. They're working. They're planting. They're doing everything that they're supposed to do. The sower is going forth to sow. But yet every time that the Midianites descend upon them, what happens? Israel abandons their own harvest. They abandon their own harvest. Look at verse 2. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains, and caves and strongholds. Are you seeing what's going on here? What happens is the children of Israel are planting, and they're planting, and they're working, and then the enemy descends into the land to fight them, and Israel flees into the mountains. They abandon the harvest and they abandon their land. They build dens and caves and caverns in the mountains and they watch as everything is destroyed beneath them because of Midian. That's what the Bible said. It said it twice. Because of Midian. Because of their enemy, Israel abandons their land. Because of their enemy, they walk away from their field. And because of the enemy, they yield their harvest. They abandon their harvesting tools. And because of Midian, they built dwelling places and strongholds in the mountain. Now, I want you to notice something with me. They abandon, I said this a moment ago. They abandon not just the harvest, they also abandon the land. Let your mind, let your mind kind of soak that in. Because God's gonna, God's gonna reveal some stuff to some folks in this room right now that's really gonna make an impact on your life going forward and how you live for God. Because they didn't just walk away from their harvest. They walked away from their fields. They didn't just stand back, say, okay, everybody, now listen, just stand back and let's just let the Midianites take the harvest. No, no, no. They fled. They ran. Skedaddled, right? They got out of there. They abandoned even the land. But, but, but the land was theirs. The land had been given to them by God. Nobody could change that. This was God's promise to them. They didn't just abandon the harvest. They abandoned the promise. Why is that a big deal? I'm going to show you why that's a big deal. At every annual encounter with the enemy, Israel would do the same thing. They would plant, they would plant, they would plant. And when the enemy came in, they would run to the mountains. They would run to the mountains. They would watch the enemy come in. They would watch the enemy destroy their harvest. And then, the, then, then Israel would come back down from the mountain, come back down after they'd been gone for a while, and then they would reclaim the same piece of land every single year. Reclaiming the same status of what God had already I cannot tell you how many times I have watched that happen in the lives of people who I, honest to God, believe in their heart, want to live for God. But I watch them walk away. I watch them disappear. I watch them give up on God. I watch them flee to the mountains and do other things. And the enemy comes in and pummels their harvest and takes whatever it is they've been working and sowing, and he takes it and he ruins it and he destroys it. And every year, oh, maybe sometimes about Easter, sometimes about Christmas, they come down from the mountain and they walk into the church for one reason and that is to claim the piece of land that they've already claimed seven times before. Reclaiming the same thing. And guess what? It's something that really and truly already belongs to you. God has already given it to you. God has already established it to be so. You are coming in and praying back through so quickly that your head spins and everybody else does too. But you're reclaiming the land. And then what happens is as soon as the enemy comes in, you run. You 
run to the mountains again. See, the land had always belonged to Israel. This was God's promise to them. And every year, Israel would have to come back and be restored to their land. Restoration is a great thing. But I'll tell you one thing. There's only one thing greater, and that's harvest. At some point, at some point, we as Christians need to get a little bit discontented with constantly being restored to the same place that we've always been. At some point, we need to look at the land and say, I've been working, I've been sowing, I have been, I've been trying to be faithful. I don't want to run away from this again and come back and reclaim this only to get no further than I ever have. At some point, somebody needs to get bent out of shape a little bit and say, it's time for me to enjoy the harvest that's been planted in the field God gave me. You think, and you're acting like the enemy wants the land. He don't want the land. Can I say it again? He don't want. He don't. He don't want the land. The, the land is the land is not is not his desire. Understand, Israel would reclaim the land after every single invasion, but their land was never seized. Their land was never possessed. The enemy would come in, pummel the ground, destroy the harvest, and leave. And then Israel would come back, retake the land. The land never belonged to anyone else. Why did Midian do that? Because Midian doesn't want the land. Are you hearing me? The enemy doesn't want the land. The only thing the enemy wants is the harvest. The only thing he wants is what you've been working for. What he wants is what you've been putting in the ground. See, Midian doesn't care about the territory. Israel's territory is tied to a covenant. And that territory was promised to Abraham. So Midian doesn't come to steal the land. They just want to eat up the harvest. Seven years. Are y'all with me? Seven years this has been happening. Seven years they've been doing this, and by now they have shown their hand. I told you the enemy has one MO. To steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. And if it doesn't qualify or somehow fit into that agenda, the enemy wants nothing to do with it. Well, guess what? He, he, he can't really steal, kill, or destroy the land. The only thing he can still kill and destroy is the harvest of the land. That's not the only reason he don't want it. Midian, they don't care about the territory. The territory is promised to Abraham. Seven years they've been doing this. They've been descending on Israel like a swarm. They come in every year. They steal the harvest, and then they leave. After seven years of doing this, they have proven what their intentions are. And so by hiding away in the caves and the strongholds, Israel has proven that their intentions are what they are when it comes to the harvest. Israel is content to forfeit the harvest they have worked so hard to plant as long as they can just keep possession of their promise. As long as I can come back down once a year and reclaim the land. I'm never, I'm never making any progress because all I, all I keep doing is going in and repairing what the enemy has destroyed. And I work and I plant and I plant and the enemy comes in and he takes it all and he doesn't just take the harvest, he tears up the land so I got to come behind and I don't have ground that's actually getting healthy and more fertile. I have ground that's being torn up every year. So I'm coming down from the mountain and I'm having to reclaim and repair and restore every year. Every year. Every 
year. Again, please don't misunderstand what your pastor is saying. Restoration is a beautiful thing for someone who has walked away. But if you are sitting in this building right now and you have been living for God and serving God, you have got to get to a place where you get discontented with constantly being restored and reclaiming the same piece of ground. That is not God's will for you. It is not God's will. To, it's not God's will for you to come back after 30 years, walk away, come back, walk away, come back, walk away, and, and, and constantly. But no, no, no. He wants you to begin to plant into the ground that He has given you. And in due season, the law of the harvest is going to come to pass. And if you will faint not, you will be the one that reaps the harvest. What's Paul mean when he says, faint not? Don't run to the mountains. Don't flee the field. Don't run and hide in a cave. Don't hide yourself somewhere and watch the end because the harvest is going to come. God does not magically put his hand on the ground and stop the harvest from coming up for your enemy. Be great if he did, but he don't. The law of the harvest is immutable. That that's put in the ground is going to come up out of the ground. Whoever's there to get it is the one that's going to reap it. <laughs> oh, oh, this is exciting me a little bit because, oh my goodness, there's so much power, there's so much potential that's locked up in what I'm saying right now for some of you. I'm so excited for where some of you are in your walk with God right now. I'm so excited for where some of you new Christians are, some of you new attenders. I'm so excited for where some of you veterans and, and long-time attenders are right now because I've come to this place with, a, with an absolute mandate to tell you you need to get to the place where you are not content to continue to reclaim the same piece of property over and and over and over again. That was Israel's problem. Content to forfeit the harvest as long as they could keep their promise. You can take our fruit, just let us keep our field. You can take our fruit, just let us keep our land. All the while God is saying, but I've given you that land. I, I've given you that land. That, that field is rightfully yours. But the fruit thereof, the harvest, well, you're going to have to fight for that. <laughs> the land is yours, Brother Jeremy. But what comes out of the ground, you're going to have to fight for that. Tooth and nail. Picking up every weapon God's given you to fight with. You're going to absolutely have to fight to keep the enemy from plundering the harvest that you've been working to see. There's some people in here right now, I believe in this church right now. There's some watching online, I believe it, feel it in the Holy Ghost. But I do believe there's some people in here right now, God's word is pricking your heart today. God's word is doing a work in your soul right now. Because maybe, just maybe, you found yourself a little too quick to abandon the harvest. Maybe you found yourself a little too quick to abandon the land. You can't even consider a harvest because it seems like every time you make up in your mind to live for God, you're always having to go back and take possession of the same field again. Never growing. And you wonder why. I'm telling you why today. I don't mean it rudely. I don't mean it hatefully. By, 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 all me, by no means do I mean it hatefully. But I'm trying to hopefully flip the light switch on and show you why you're struggling like some of you are. You can't even consider the harvest. You're not growing. That's what harvest does. It allows you to grow. You're always reclaiming that which God has already given you. Oh, it's great to march down there and take back what the devil stole from you. That's a great altar call song that gets everybody shouting. But at some point, you've got to move beyond that. 
Well, I went to the enemy's camp, and I take him back what he stole for. That's great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. But at some point, you need to take the next step in your faith walk, not just reclaiming things of value, but never giving them up in the first place. How about this? Devil, you can't have my harvest. You can't have this land. You might kill me in the process, but I believe some things are worth fighting for. And my harvest... Not just reclaiming things all the time. But getting to the point where you say, I'm not, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to let you take that today, devil. <laughs> not, not giving it up. No, 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 no. I, I'm not disrespecting anybody's struggle. I'm not disrespecting anybody's walk. Have I been there? Yes, I have been there. Yes, I have lost things. Yes, I've had to reclaim things. But at some point, every one of us have got to get to the point where we stop being satisfied with reclaiming and bow our back and say, I'm not giving it up. I'm not walking out. I will not run to the cave. I will not hide behind a rock. I've worked too hard to see my family saved. I've worked too hard to see this harvest. Devil, you cannot, you cannot have this harvest. Contrasted against this image, in the word of the Lord, of Israel's men, men of war, supposedly, hiding in dens and caverns, standing in polar opposite to this story is yet another story, that of a man named Shema. His story is found in 2 Samuel chapter number 23. Some of you may know it. For those of you who do and for those of you who don't, I'm going to read a couple of verses. Read along with me if you can. And after him was Shema, the son of Aji, the Heratite, Her Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground Full of lentils. And the people. Ah, this looks familiar. What did the people do? The people fled from the Philistines. Ran away. Doesn't say, but I just about bet they had somewhere carved out safe for them to go and watch what was about to happen. What they did not expect was what happened next. Verse 12. But he stood, Shema, in the midst of the ground and defended it. <laughs> Are you serious? One guy. Everybody runs away. All too familiar story, right? One guy says, I've heard how this story ends. He looks down, and the Bible says that the piece of ground was full of lentils. What does that mean? That means that it was harvest time, that it was time for reaping, that, 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 that everything he'd been working for was now coming into full bloom. And something got all over Shema. He said, no. I've been working way too hard on this bean patch right here. I've been working way too hard on this little piece of ground right here to just give this to a bunch of dirty Philistines. So the Bible said, he stood his ground in the middle of the bean patch. He stood there, and he defended it. And without the help of any of his brethren, the Bible said he slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Oh, 
Now, can't you just see? Can't you just see those others coming down from the mountain? We knew you had it, Shema. We, we knew you had it. We just wanted a good vantage point. You know, we need to be back here where we can video this and put this on fo- Facebook later. Somebody had to be a witness to what was going to be happening or nobody would live to tell the story. We knew, wouldn't you like to be one of the ones that, 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 that claimed part of that victory? Oh, yeah, you know, the others ran to the cave, but me and Shema. No. The writer here knew there's only one guy that stood his ground, listed among David's mighty men is this man. Shema, who stood in a garden of beans and he defended it against a a band of Philistines. Scripture tells us it was full of lentils. It was harvest time. But when the enemy came in marching to invade, something rose up within this man. First of all, this is my land and I will not abandon this land. But on top of that, what you see coming up out of the ground That belongs to me. That's my harvest. Those are my beans. They're good for your heart. That's mine. You can't have it. I'm not going to give it up. You didn't think I could pull it back, did you? It's mine. It's mine. You can't have it. You can't take it. I've been working for that. You don't know the nights I've stayed up praying for that. You don't know the hard conversations I've had with people to make sure this was done right, to make sure the tilling of the ground was done correctly, to make sure the planting of the seed was done correctly. You don't know how many times that I have had to that I have had to shoo off the varmints and shoo off the animals and keep things from you think I'm going to sit back and watch a bunch of Philistines come in and steal what I've been def- No, 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 not on your life. I'll die here defending my harvest. Because some things are worth fighting for. Forget taking back what's stolen. I refuse to let it be stolen. Forget coming back and reclaiming it. Forget going back down to down to the Philistines, uh, you know, their, their, their little camp down there and, and finding all them lentils and bringing them back. No, 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 no. I, I'm not interested in doing that. I don't want to give it up in the first place. And you're not going to plunder and destroy this bean patch. I'll fight for it. We'll go toe-to-toe because I'm not going to tuck tail and run. I can see what's beginning to bloom because this is what I've been praying for. This is what I've been waiting. Is anybody here hear what I'm talking about right now? Oh! somebody needs to jump to your feet and declare it as loud as you can I've been praying for my kids for far too long I've been looking for the day that I can be blessed too I made up my mind that this harvest is worth the fight Oh, somebody ought to praise him in this house. Come on, if you really love him, if you really love him, you ought to shout your hat, shout your mouth out right now. Give your voice lifted unto God. Hallelujah. 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 Here's what you got to remember. Hear your pastor today, please. Here's what you ha- I have to too. This is what we have to remember. It's not about the land. It's not about the territory. The fight you're going through right now is not about the field. I told you just a moment ago, and I'll reiterate this point. Territory is tied to covenant. You have it because God promised it to you. The property is tied to the covenant. So therefore, the property becomes the promise. The promise is because of a covenant. 
enemy's not interested in your covenant. Anybody know why? Because he knows he can never have it. He knows he can never have it. He knows that that promise is directly tied to a covenant with God, which he is completely void and unable to ever have again. So he can, come on, somebody needs to hear me. So he can never have the promise again. He can never own the property again. I've come to tell somebody in this place that knows your blood bought, Holy Ghost field, Jesus paid an ultimate price for you. I'm telling you right now, the devil has no claim on your life. The devil has no claim on your ground. He has no claim on your home. He has, mm, listen, he's not even coming after that. Pastor, did you really just say he's not coming after my home? Hear me. He's coming after your harvest. Because if he can keep you spinning your wheels, if he can keep you running in pace, he'd much rather have you on a treadmill than have you in a marathon. Running, 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 going nowhere. He'd much rather have you right there as to run in the only race that counts. So yeah, in, in some ways, yes, he would love to see your home destroyed, but he knows the way to do that is to destroy the harvest of the home. Try to destroy all the fruitfulness of your life, your spouse's life. Destroy the fruitfulness of the experience your children have had in God. Try to pull all that back. It's not really important. That really don't matter. You put away too much stock in that. You're putting way too much investment in that. You're getting a little too caught up in that. He'll tell you all kinds of junk. That's exactly what it is. And I'd use a more colorful word if I weren't a Christian. He, you tell you all kinds of junk. All he's trying to do is eat up your harvest. Because if he can eat up the harvest, he can eventually render your mindset that the land is not worth fighting for anymore. And why would you ever walk out on something God himself is willing to fight for you to have? See, the devil knows he, he, he can't have the land. The devil knows he can't have the, the promise. The devil knows that covenant's never going to be his. He can never have it. God, God has said it, so it, it is so. God has already declared it. Joshua chapter number 1. Every place, this is what he said. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses, I've not changed my mind. The land that you're walking in now, God says, I've given that to you. That's yours. That's covenant ground. Territory belongs to the people of God because of the promises of God. But the harvest in the ground, that's going to have to be fought for. The promise, hear it this way, the promise cannot be stolen, but the harvest can. I said the promise cannot be stolen, but the harvest can. I need you to hear me clear because it's a battle you're going to fight every reaping season. I just don't understand why. He has one goal to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's it. One goal. That's his goal. So he's going to come at you, and he doesn't come at you when there's no harvest. No. <laughs> he came at Jesus when Jesus was at his most spiritual, in the midst of a fast, in a retreat on a mountain. Oh, he doesn't come at you when you're weak and you've got nothing to offer him. He's not coming for the land. He's coming for the harvest. 
It's when you think everything is going good. It's when you think all the kids are acting exactly like they're supposed to. It's when you think everything is lined up finally. Everything is finally lined up like it's supposed to. You better hold on to yourself. Because there's a devil that's trying his best to wiggle into something. Because he wants to eat up that harvest. Seven years, Israel, Israel, the Israelites sowed, and then the Midianites came. Every year, the harvest grew. They were busy planting, working. Every year, it's taken away. And I can't help but wonder. Maybe you can too. And I understand what God said about because of their disobedience. I can't help but wonder if the reason that Midian kept coming back every year was because Israel kept abandoning their own promised land. See, the enemy knows exactly what you're willing to give up. And the enemy knew if you're willing to leave the land, the land that even God would fight on your behalf to preserve for you, then surely you don't care about what's in the land. Everybody hear me today? <clears throat> as we stand here in this building, sit in this building, as we're here in this service on the precipice of celebrating 30 great years of this church, we've heard the sermons, we have received the prophecies, and yes, I do believe God has given us this city, every place where our feet step upon this land, God has given the people of God this city. In addition to that, the law of the harvest has been in effect for those 30 years. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail here, but I will say it this way. Whatever we have sown, in 30 years is what we have reaped. Whatever we have sown, good, bad, excellent, or otherwise, is what we have reaped. We have reaped what we have put into the ground. And no matter if you're here in this building today and you are receiving this word for you yourself personally and your family or, or you're just your life, or whether you're receiving this word for this church body corporately as a whole. I want to tell somebody the harvest has always been there. This time we see the harvest is something that's worth fighting for. When Midian comes in, and Midian will. And the enemy shall come in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. That's not running to the hill. That's not running to the caves. When the enemy comes in, when Midian comes in, when Midian arms himself with, with Am 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 Amalekites, when, when they come flooding in to pummel and destroy the, the ground and the, and, 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 the, and, and the harvest that's there, God help them to meet a church God help them to meet a family. God help them to meet one saint of God, one Shama who is ready to fight, who says, you might be coming against me and I might be outnumbered, but I'm the one that fought for these lentils. I'm the one that fought for this ground. This harvest belongs to me and I will not give it up. Stand with me all across this place, if you will. I need to be finished today. God help Midian to find a church ready to fight. Not just defending the land, defending the harvest of the land. Defending the land would be adequate to just standing back and say, okay, we're going to stand over here while you take what you came for. No, 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 no. We're going to defend it all. 
we're going to stand in the middle of the garden and say, devil, you can't have what we've been working for. Now, if you go a little bit deeper, and I don't have time to dig into this, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of something to chew on here. I'd encourage you to go home, study this out, dig it out for yourself because it's pretty incredible. <clears throat> what does Midian represent? This is a story. This is a message all in its own. Like I said, I'm not going to preach it. don't have time to. What does Midian represent? If you look up the word, you will find the word strife and the word contention. You know who the Midianites were, you Bible readers? The Midianites were descended from Midian. And Midian was a son of Abraham. Now hang on a minute, Pastor. Hang, hang on a minute. This almost sounds like they were fighting their own family. the stomach there, isn't it? Descendant of Abraham. <laughs> One of the greatest threats. What does Midian represent? Midian, Midian is strife, but specifically strife that comes from within the bloodline. One of the greatest threats to the harvest, ladies and gentlemen, hear me, please hear me. One of the greatest threats to the harvest is strife that can rise up from within the body. Strife, bickering, complaining, murmuring that can rise up from within. Yes, a church family. Yes, a family household. Divided homes are dangerous places. And yes, even from within yourself. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. One of the most dangerous things to your harvest is strife that comes from within. Because the source of the strife is often trusted until it can't be trusted anymore. Of the seven things that are referred to as an abomination to God. In Proverbs chapter number 6, do you realize that four of those directly refer to hurting other people? And among those is sowing discord among the brethren. Pastor, why are you preaching on this today? Because it's part of the it's part of the and it's part of the definition of the word. So you need to get this. This is all all part of the sermon. I'm not preaching this cuz we got this problem. I'm preaching this to keep from having this problem. There's a reason that these seven things and these four that directly hurt others are things that the Bible says that God despises so much. You know why? Because it represents the spirit of Midian. And the spirit of Midian is coming to rob you of your harvest. And I've come to this church today. I've walked in this building today to declare somebody needs to bind and cast out the spirit of Midian, whether it be in your life, in your, in your mind, in your home, in your family, in the church, wherever it is, you need to cast that out. Philippians chapter 2 finally says this, says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Let nothing be done through strife. Let nothing be done with Midian's input. Let nothing be done with Midian's help. God's trying to tell some of us right now, you don't need Midian for the battle I got you to fight. You don't need Midian's input in what's happening right now in your family. You don't need the influence of the outsider to come back in who has tried to destroy you before to try to convince you. He, he's there for one reason, to, to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to eat up the harvest that you've been planting. Don't let that happen. Cast out that spirit from within you. Get it out of the camp so that then you can enjoy what God said is rightfully yours.
I don't know who all I've been preaching to today, but whoever it is, right now, the altar, boom, is open. I want you to come. Come, 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 come. Walk up around here. Gather up, crowd up around here as tight as you can. Come up around here because we're going to worship for a few minutes. We're going to give glory to God for a few minutes. And if there's anybody in this place that wants to just walk up here and declare it loud and clear for the enemy to hear and anyone else to hear, I want you to come up here and make your mind up and declare it. We are not giving up what God has given us. We are not we are not forfeiting. We are not walking away. We are not fleeing. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to defend this bean patch. I'm going to stand here and defend the harvest because the harvest is worth fighting for. Come on, somebody. Somebody. Why don't you clap with them right now? Oh, it's a struggle for survival. We daily meet the foe We're out there on the battlefield Sometimes we stand alone That's when we reach for our holy Reach for armor. your armor today I pick up my shield of faith And I march on to the battlefield Somebody open Take your mouth, get ready sword Here we go the mountain is high, but it's not too steep. But the battle is rough, but I'm not too weak. And I won't turn back. Oh, no. I won't turn back. You said it last week. Say it again the today. The road is hot, but it's not too long. The enemy is here, but he's not too strong. And I won't turn back. Oh, no. no. I won't turn back. not too steep and the battle is rough and I'm not too weak and I won't turn back oh no oh no I won't, I won't turn, turn back. back come on well the road is hot but it's not too long and the enemy is near but he's not too strong and I won't turn back oh no oh no I won't turn back Are you in the gaze in the battle today? Is anybody engaged in the battle today? Come on, it's worth fighting for. I pick up for. my shield of faith. Yeah. And I march, march on to the battlefield. I take out my sword and say, yeah. Oh, the mountain is high, but it's not too steep. The battle is rough, but I'm not too weak. And I won't turn back. Oh, no. And I won't turn back Oh no, oh no I won't turn back Yes, the mountain is high But it's not too steep The battle is rough But I'm not too weak And I won't turn back Oh no, oh no I won't turn back The road is hot But it's not too long The enemy is here But it's not too strong singing that but I want to say this really quickly we are not here today to manufacture a shout we are not here to manufacture a build a move of God that's God we are here to create an atmosphere where God can do whatever God wants to do and if God wants to move and set some people free today that's God's business and God's going to do it however hear me if you're in this building today and you've been struggling if you're in this place today and you've been fighting and you've gotten to the place where you're not sure if you can fight anymore I want to encourage somebody to step forward today I'm gonna to, we're gonna create a place right here and we're gonna pray the prayer of faith over your life over your heart over your home over your field and we're gonna pray for that harvest because I believe God has put in you what is needed to be in you to see this victory come to pass That's you, I want you to join us up here. Come on, come on. As, as each person comes, I need some saints of God to fall in behind them. 
because we're going to anoint these people. We're going to pray for these people. And God is going to give the victory today. Does anybody in this church hear what I'm saying? I said God is going to give some people the victory today. We're going to pray. And God's going to do something in some lives today. How many of you got faith to see it today? How many of you got faith to see some people strengthened in the Holy Ghost today? Come on, come on, come on. That's what's happening right now. That's what it's all about right now. Somebody finding their strength and their courage to stand up in the middle of their field and say, Devil, you cannot have my harvest. You cannot have what I'm fighting for. This is mine. Joyful noise, blow the trumpet and shout, let's praise him for the victory. 